So who remembers what we were talking about last week? Anyone? <laughs> All right, well, well, let me remind you. Because I'm going to actually bring this, this little nugget up. We're doing a, three, a series of three on the truth shall set you free, and we're on series two. So the, the idea that I'm really enjoying about the truth that will set, three, the truth that will set us free the idea that I mentioned is from this book, The Bible With and Without Jesus, and it's by um, a Jewish scholar and a Christian scholar. And it's at the very beginning explaining the differences between Judaism and Christianity. And they said something that I thought was so fascinating and has really been mulling around in my soul. And what she was, they were saying was that in Judaism, one is born into Judaism. So it's not just uh, a religion, it's an ethnic identity uh, and or a national identity. Christianity is not an ethnic identity, so you don't get born, well you can be born into Christianity, but your belongingness is not about your race or ethnicity, it is about your belief system. So you can be Jewish, or you are Jewish, and you're Jewish for life. No matter what you believe, you can be an Orthodox Jew, a conservative Jew, a Reformed Jew, you can be an atheist Jew, you can be a Buddhist Jew, but you'll always be Jewish. It's there forever. What allows then for a lot of freedom to explore and to make choices. What they're pointing out is in Christianity, what, what unifies our belongingness is belief. And that belief be starts to become very important because what connects you with your community is that you believe pretty much the same things. So this allows, they were pointing out, this may, has made it a little bit more challenging in Christianity to challenge beliefs because if you, like how many beliefs can you challenge before you're no longer in agreement with everybody else in the community? Now we can go to the extreme. Sometimes we know in, the, in, say, the Catholic teaching, if you push too much, you can actually be excommunicated if you don't live in the way. You can't be excommunicated from Judaism. You can take yourself out of it, but you'll always be Jewish. And I just, I just really have, that has just animated my awareness. Because even in our teaching, our teaching here at, at Centers for Spiritual Living, which is a new thought teaching, we have a set of core beliefs. And so, the, or we call them principles, and we believe in the principles. <laughs> and so that's what unifies us with each other. And I think we're, that one of the things that draws many of us to this teaching is that it's very open-ended. So it's not very, it's not, the beliefs are very wide open and don't really confine. So I can be in centers for spiritual living as all of you, and we all have our different teachers, and we have different communities. You can learn Hinduism, Buddhism, and still be part of this organization. So it's the, the lines of other aren't there because our basic fundamental belief is in oneness. No matter what, we can't leave oneness. We're always one with each other. But then we have these other beliefs. And so I've just been thinking a lot about this idea of belonging. And so last week, what I was re talking about, uh, that several ministers are bringing into their community and, and talking about it here is that even before belief, we belong. That, so they're creating belonging groups and that when people first come say, you belong here, no matter what you believe, no matter where you are on your journey, no matter what your path is, you belong here. We start with that. And then as we continue in classes, you can have the freedom to explore beliefs because you agreeing with everybody is no longer a requirement to belong here because you already know you belong. And that allows for a lot of freedom to explore things because now you, it's not predicated on you have to agree with the group. Love that so much. It felt very wonderful. Because for myself, this has been a really big issue. I think it's why it's really stuck with me and I'm doing a three-part series on it because it's really hit home for me. Uh, I, when I grew up, I had a really powerful experience of becoming one with divine love. But I also lived in a family that uh, didn't really believe, I shouldn't even say really, 
didn't believe in the transcendent, or at least said they didn't know. So my dad was an atheist, my mom was an agnostic. I should also say, they never defined themselves that way. Because what they really believed in, more than anything, was the search for your own answers. What was pushed on us was think for yourself, think for yourself. My dad, I said, why didn't you tell me this when I was a kid? He said, I don't want to sway you one way or the other. I wanted you to find your own answers. He goes, I know I had the intelligence to sway you when you're three years old. That's not my job as your father. My job as a father is for you to find your own answers. So he used to say to us, be more interested in truth than in being right. My mom used to say, a faith that can't stand up to questioning isn't much of a faith. And I had to question all the time, because on the one hand, I had the spiritual experience, which to me was a capital R. It was more real than anything on this earth, and I knew it as a little girl. Once you had that experience, you can't forget it. But at the same time, I had this family that was so interesting, and we, I, I'm not going to get into the three arguments now, but I remember my brother, who ended up becoming a Harvard lawyer, giving three arguments as to why God didn't exist. I can still remember those three arguments, and they were very good, and I was very torn between my intellect Listening to him, like, well, that actually makes a lot of sense to my experience. That was the sandpaper in my life. Like, how do I know anything with my mind and my heart and my body? How do I live this world? And so that was a sandpaper that, that, compelled, that pushed me on. And, and I'm guessing that almost everybody, everyone here, has had that same experience very similar, maybe, that somewhere along the way you've had that sandpaper of a disconnect with, with what, what the world is believing and what you experience, but you can't quite figure out like what you think about all this yet. And so, so there's some sandpaper. Because as we're seeking truth, or at least I shouldn't, I'm guessing this is true for you, at least for me, it can make us really uncomfortable. And what it did for me was always gave me a little, little side of, I don't totally belong. Like, I am totally a member of my family, but I don't totally belong there because I don't really look at the world the way the rest of my family, the collective, there was five of them, believed. I didn't have that same ground point. So I'm guessing many of you had similar experiences growing up maybe in a religion or a faith or a, or a family value system that didn't quite fit. And it was the sandpaper that grows us. But I'm grateful at the same time because I had two th that really both really solid foundations. The solid solid foundation that I knew God existed. I knew this presence was love. This wasn't a theological construct. This was a direct experience construct. I knew that I knew that I knew, and I knew it was all love. And I knew everyone was immersed in this love. I knew that in my heart. I didn't articulate it that way. I just knew. I also had the freedom to question. I never felt fear about, we didn't grow up with a, um, any idea of, if there's no God, there's certainly no devil. So I didn't grow up with the devil or hell. So I felt completely free to question. So I had both things going on. And then when life got really tough, well, well first, and then that exploring brought me to new thought. And I was just, woohoo, love this. One power, one presence, it made sense to me. It was hitting my rational mind as well as my heart. Ah, that's what I experienced when I was a kid. And there's a whole philosophy and theology that aligns with it. It was so exciting. I was like, wee. And so much so I moved across country to be around it because I knew that I'd hit on something that really aligned me where I had had so much sandpaper. And then when I went through a really tough time, and this is about 30 years ago, I was just like, okay, I don't want theology. I just, I just want that which is going to serve and help me what is true. And that's when I really got involved in this idea of oneness. And I loved Joel Goldsmith because he is a New Thought mystical teacher, and he really hammers away at this idea of oneness. That ultimately, he says that he believes that a lot of people, most people struggle because they really do believe in two powers. We say there's one power, but we actually really believe in two powers. And we talk as if there's two powers all the time. And so he was just, I was, The Thunder of Silence was the book, and he would just hammer away. There's not two powers, there's only one power. There's only one power, and it's always good. It is always good. There's only one power. And so when I was in a time of crisis, that was exactly what I needed. 
But it was challenging too because I was working at a job where the guy who owned the business was very consciously and articulately scamming companies. <laughs> it was a temporary job. <laughs> But I was like, wow, there's only one power and presence. It's always good, but I'm working with this guy who's very clearly choosing to scam people. And I, so I had to really struggle with this idea of oneness. It didn't just come naturally. Oh, of course, everything's one and everything's good. That helped me when I was in a bad place. But as I began to heal, I had to start questioning, well, what's going on here? And then I started working in a psychiatric hospital. And I was taking classes in, in, in Centers for Spiritual Living. And I would, there were some patients who would hear voices that were negative, that were saying pretty awful things. And then I would go to class, which I would say spiritual progressive world, and people would talk about these wonderful angelic voices and my higher beings. And I said, well, how can you believe in those voices, but you don't believe in the dark voices? And I was, again, struggling with this idea of oneness. Like, there's, so there's duality. I see duality on the surface of the world. I see duality in the energy world. Where is this one, one is coming? And it's what these questions do, just as we heard in the reading today, the questions take us deeper. If we are not afraid to ask the questions, if we are not afraid to look right at the questions and say, help me to understand this because I'm not understanding this, it will take us deeper. And nobody can answer these questions for us, by the way. No, maybe if you go to, there are spiritually enlightened teachers who can just like open up your third eye and you can see. That can help you, but no intellectual answer is going to do it for you. You have to go deep into a spiritual, another way of seeing and knowing that's beyond the human mind just to really answer these questions. So I would say it took me about three years to really get this idea of oneness and be able to say it with some sense of, I really know this is true. Because then I, you know, I went back to my childhood experience, so I knew it was true, but, and I was beginning to come to understanding of these different layers, and that oneness included all of it. It didn't, it didn't, the oneness of goodness actually included the darker parts. But then I was in classes, and a lot of times in classes, people would just say, oh yeah, I believe in oneness, oh yeah, there's no good and evil, and it would upset me to no end. I'm like, you just are saying that. That's just like a surface understanding. And it would drive me, I'm like, do you really know that there's no oneness? Are you saying that when bad things happen out here, it's all good? Or, you know, and, and, and so again comes the sandpaper. Again comes the feeling that oh, I don't quite belong here because I can't say things the way other people say them. I can't say them as easily as other people say them because I always see the exceptions. <laughs> I see that they're true. I love, I love Ken Wilber's view. Um, he had calls himself an integralist because he says there's a partial truth to every perspective, but no perspective has the whole truth. And so I would say, yeah, that's true. I know prayer works. I know the power. There's oneness, but, there, but it's deeper and it's richer and it's fuller. There's so many different dimensions to that. And so I started to feel this feeling again. I think, this is, again, why I'm going back to this reading of not belonging because I couldn't say things the way other people said. And that became sandpaper again for my growth. Have any of you ever experienced that on your spiritual journey? That even as you have found communities and places that you feel comfortable with, that there's some sandpaper that say, well, I don't know if I totally agree with what is being said. I agree with partially, but I don't agree with everything. I think of the idea of infinite possibilities. I love it, the idea of infinite possibilities. That's the psychic realm, this realm of, for those of you, like Akashic records, and, and anything is possible, the quantum field. <laughs> and what that is, is saying that in this other energy field, there's infinite possibilities, and we don't have to live by past precedent. We don't have to live, and our, so there's, a, there's something called the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And the fixed mindset says, this is what I've always known, this is what, and I can't be anything else. The growth mindset says, there's possibilities. I can change these circumstances. I can have a different way of showing up in the world, in relationships, in money, in job, in creativity. I can have something different. This is infinite possibilities, no past precedent. It's exciting, and it's empowering, and it's joyful, and it's vital, and it's alive, and it works. That's the most beautiful thing about it, is it works. Most of the time, or some of the time, but sometimes it doesn't. And then what do we do with that information? 
Do we just not ignore it? I remember when I was in ministerial school, I was really interested in this topic of healing because I was working in a psych hospital and working with patients, I would work, do this oneness, and I would say I had dramatic healings with about 10%, maybe impacted 20 to 30% through my, that, just the consciousness of loving them in oneness. But there's a whole bunch of people I didn't feel like I even had any t impact on. So I recognize this, this is a lot more going on. There's a lot more to the story. And we don't always like to look at it. There was a Templeton Foundation research um, prayer, research on prayer, and I, it was like in the millions, and it was a great research study, and it came out that there was no significant difference. And then I read one almost the exact same time that was done at Santa Barbara, same thing. Now, I think all of us know of the books that tell us that there is a significant difference, that prayer does make a difference, and it does. They're both true. But, the, but often on this journey, we only look at the things we want to see and not the things we don't want to see, but the richness and the fullness comes by being, allowing ourselves to be uncomfortable and say, okay, why didn't it work those times? Why was there no significant difference there? To me, that's what brings life alive because now I'm really looking at the multidimensional world and not just a linear one idea. We are not just machines that just pound out, okay, I say it's good and now it's good, now it's good, it's good. You know, you know, their life, that would make life so dull. Even my father, when he was making an argument for why God existed, he said, well, God, would, this divine presence would have to be invisible and hard to find because if it was outward clear as day, we would have no free will. We would all be robots. We wouldn't think for ourselves. We wouldn't have all these dimensions and layers of beauty, of creativity, because we'd already know the answer. It was just like, here's the answer, dot, check, nothing. What, what's left. Part of this journey is the beauty and the richness of the multidimensional forms. People, I just look, looked at Peggy, people who do art know the beauty of sh shadow when you're painting. That art changed when they started recognizing, oh, we can have shadow. And then suddenly the paintings became more multidimensional. Our lives, our spiritual lives become more multidimensional when we allow ourselves to look at things with an open heart, open mind, open soul. It becomes richer and fuller and deeper. And I think we like those challenges. And that's why I'm sharing them today. There have been times where I have been taught by other people that the Sunday service is for the basics and you're not supposed to get into the depths and the complexities because that will shoo people away People want simple answers and clarity. And, and I, I didn't expect that response. But, 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 but I think that you already know that this is a complex life, that it's not just A equals B equals C, that there's many ways and layers to look at things. I was just thinking, I, I'm so fascinated by Jesse Itzler because he, he, talking about infinite possibilities, he pushes the boundaries all the time. So he loves exercise and he does this he did a hundred mile run I remember when I first learned about a marathon being 26 miles and I thought that was insane and then he did a hundred miles and then I realized there's a lot of people like he's getting all these people to do these crazy things and so one of the things his company started is creating these these hikes the the same distance Ascension as at Mount Everest, which is 29,029 miles. So he and his company rented out for the 2023 six different mountains at six different times in the year, and people could sign up. And you have 36 hours, and you climb up the hill, and then you take a gondola down, and you climb up again, and you do it the same amount of times as it would be Mount Everest. So you have 36 hours to, to ascend at the climb as much as you would at Mount Everest. And he has young people, he has athletes, a lot of athletes. He has, there was an 80 year old guy, 60 year old woman, all different ages, people. They just had one yesterday, so it was their sixth one this year. He said, when we put out the six times to climb up that mountain, he said, all six of them were sold out in one hour. People, we do not want things necessarily easy. So when we say there's one power and one presence, when we say, well, you just belong, because I really had to struggle with this, you just belong thing. Like, I know it's beautiful, but the other part of me is like, 
No, I want to be part of a community that is stretching, that is desires to grow, desires to understand, to do, go deeper and wider. I love being around people who ask questions and say, well, I don't know if I know if that, I don't know if that really works for me or if that's really true and get a little uncomfortable. The interesting thing about Jesse and his gang <laughs> is they love to suffer. <laughs> they talk about, oh yeah, we're going towards suffering, which we hate in our teaching. But they also say, but you don't let any negative thoughts come in. So you take, you take on ideas or things that seem almost impossible and you push, but you don't let negative thoughts because the negative thoughts will spiral you down. So they're doing both. They're embracing the challenges of growth, but at the same time, they're, they're, they know that there's this positive energy that will support them to fulfill the suffering. Do you get that? It's a, it's a little odd. But, it, but I'm drawn to it. I watch it. I'm like, wow, so cool. They're going towards their suffering and at the same time using the powerful of the positive energy to carry them through it to another. And the reason why he does it is because he says you discover parts of yourself you never would know that are there. If we only have simple life without tension, Brian Swimmy, the great cosmologist, talks about this. If the universe had no tension, it would never grow or expand. Our growth and expansion and expansion and depth is dependent on that sandpaper growth. So I want to give an example, because I thought it was beautiful, of, uh, so in, they give a, this is just at the very beginning, so they're just giving an example of in, in Judaism, the, the, they have four different ways of interpreting uh, scripture. And this is at the, they're not getting into the depth here. They say each of these four interpretations, there's actually a lot written out, so they're just taking a quick excerpt of each just to give a, a style. And I loved it so much, I wanted to share it with you today. So they have four types of way of interpreting a verse. One is called, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but just pretend I am. <laughs> there's the Pishat, which is just sort of the literal straightforward understanding. Then there's remez, which is an allegorical meaning. Then there's dirash, which is a homiletical meaning, and sod, which is, which is a mis mystical meaning. So they took Michael Fishbane's book, uh, Song of Commentary on the Song of Songs. And so he goes through at quite a lot of detail, apparently in his book, about different verses in Song of Songs and these four ways of interpreting it. And they're just taking one very quick example. So uh, the, the verse they're taking is, Oh, give me of the kisses of your mouth. That's it. It's from Song chapter 1, verse 2. Oh, give me of the kisses of your mouth. So the Pishat interpretation. It articulates the speaker's intense longing for a kiss. Straightforward understanding. Dirash, which is the allegorical meaning. At the center of covenant love stands Mount Sinai, the classic site of revelation, whose words are like kisses. The remez, which is the homiletical meaning. Kisses boldly express the intensity of the longing for contact with God. The kiss represents the desired infusion of the divine reality into the human self, the yearning for spiritual transformation. It is a moment of meeting that silences speech. And lastly, the mystical meaning. The spiritual quest begins with great longing marked by absence and otherness. It wishes for contact with divinity, symbolized by a kiss. Spiritually understood, the kiss is the co-infusion of breath or spirit between one being and another. Isn't that beautiful? Every time we hear a spiritual truth, like oneness, infinite possibilities. We have an opportunity to only look at it from one meaning, which is an accurate meaning, by the way. There is only one power, one person. That's true. There are infinite possibilities. That's true. But if we look at it and say that's a partial truth and start opening ourselves and say, okay, so, so here's my invitation for you this week. It's, here are some truth that interests you and start saying, okay, I got the basic meaning. Can I come up with three other ways of understanding this exact same thing? 
three, underway, three, three uh, different ways of understanding oneness, non-duality and duality, three different ways of understanding infinite possibilities. Because at least, I don't know if you heard it, it just makes everything so rich, doesn't it? We just start opening up. I think it opens our soul, our heart, our mind, our body, because we are multidimensional beings. There's nobody here who's a robot, as far as I can tell. No chat GPTs here. No chat GPTs online. We are multidimensional beings, and we wake up. We wake up to a truth that is multidimensional, that cannot be contained just by one line or one sentence, that it's, it's actually feeling into this extraordinary mystery and mystical essence of the universe. That is the truth that sets us free. As I've been with this, I've, I've actually become more conscious of all the sandpaper that I felt because I don't always like things just on the surface. And I know many of you don't and, and look at things and I felt, well, because I like different perspectives, that makes me a little bit outside. Makes me like I don't belong. And on Friday night, Yvonne and Peggy and Marcy and I were here meditating, doing our 40 minute silent meditation. And I, I just suddenly, all these places I've been in my life, and I realized I belonged to every one of them because we are all multidimensional beings and I'm not different or separate because I like to look at things because we all feel that richness of soul. And I, I'm saying it by words, but I saw and felt I've always belonged. This is a new weirdness for me because I've always felt, and I'm saying it to you because I think maybe some of you have felt this way on your journey, a little bit on the outside. Well, I almost believe what they believe. I kind of believe what they believe. I believe 80% of what they believe or 50% of what they believe. And that, the part that doesn't match up is the part that pulls away. But what if we just say we, can, we will never all believe what everybody all believes, that everyone in this room will never mirror each other exactly in what we believe, but we still 100% belong to one another. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the beauty of what truth can do and setting us free. I love you. Let's pray. And so we let ourselves feel into this awareness of oneness and all that that one little tiny word means. We allow this oneness to guide us, to teach us, to grow us, to deepen us, to help us see beyond the world of appearance, to see the many dimensions of reality that are happening all of the time simultaneously. And that every person with whom we come in contact is a beautiful cosmos of this divine reality. That every person is a multidimensional being, a beautiful radiant cosmos of starlight and galaxies. That we see the infinite spaciousness within each and every individual. We never limit anybody to their one little words or their personality or their personality quotients or whatever those are and just recognize that that's a part true but no one can be contained by any one concept. So we let go of all the labels. We let go of all the labels. We let go of all the containing ideas and we feel and see and sense with a heart of love, the kiss of the divine, soul to soul, heart to heart, mind to mind, body to body, we are one. And as we feel this oneness here and now with ourselves and with all the planet, we do speak a special word for all those who are right now in San Diego getting so much rain that there's concern about the well-being of sentient life forms. We bless the San Diego area knowing that each and every person is contained and cared for in this divine love. As we know and hear those beautiful wise words all in the end, is good and is love. And we feel and know that love on every level and dimension of what's happening in San Diego, the fires in British Columbia, the power and the presence. We have friends who are being impacted in all these different areas in Hawaii. Every day there are things that are happening and it is our job, our joy, our love to see and to feel into the depth of the truth 
that at the very deepest place, all is well, all is well. And from that place, we hold all the different circumstances and conditions, all is well. We feel the love of the divine on every level and dimension of our being. We feel its touch. We feel its kiss into the very depth of our heart. And we just say, thank you, thank you, thank you. In deep abiding joy and everlasting peace, we give thanks for this word and we let it be as we say together now. And so it is. Amen and amen. I walk in God in all I do. I walk in God in all that I say.